Yeah, thank you very much um, for having me here. <coughs> I will present um, work we do at PIC on linking process-based impacts to integrate assessment models. And I speak on behalf of a large team working on various aspects of um, what I'm showing here. I will start off with a few general remarks um, sparked by a workshop we had at PIC on a similar topic and also on the uh, impact session of the past few days. Um, so we have um, this wealth of um, information now available from the impact community, and I'm preaching to the choir when I say this, uh, which is ripe for the taking to put into economic assessment. We have um, all the work coming out of the EasyMap project um, covering many sectors in a harmonized fashion, so you can take the results from all of the sectors and put them together in a joint analysis. Um, then also we have all of these econometric results, both aggregate as in the um, often cited work by Burke et al., but also on many different aspects of the socioeconomic system. Um, but how do we really take this and go um, to understand the economic um, uh, effects and the general socioeconomic consequences? Um, this is the question we have to answer. There is an impressive amount of work already happening, as we saw here in the past few days. Um, and I think it's really actually a moment in time um, where, as a community, we should really step back and think about this in a more systematic way, because um, everybody sort of picks and takes certain aspects of these things, puts it into studies, gets interesting, very exciting results, um, but we are still letting, lacking a comprehensive understanding um, of what really matters in these fields and how um, we need to model it. Um, and uh, I want to um, briefly address a couple aspects on this. The first is to understand the dynamics and the persistence. This relates to this um, debate on, on growth versus level effects. And that's, of course, something that the econometric community in the first instance has to answer. But we also need to think about how, what does this mean for our models? How do we include it in our models? And also, what are the underlying dynamics if you have persistent effects? If you have a growth effect, where does that come from? Um, and so we sh should think about really putting um, the impacts not only on GDP, but putting it on individual uh, channels on the drivers of growth. And in a study um, we did a couple of years ago, um, we put an, a similar GDP shock on different drivers of growth. I see I'm missing the legend here. I'm sorry, so this is for income, for capital, um, for labor, and then for product, labor productivity. Um, and you get very different um, di dynamics after the shock happens. Um, so we really need to um, think about these dynamics. Then we really we have a lot of possible channels. Um, we have a lot of biophysical impacts for which we have data. Um, and we have a lot of possible channels in the economic system where these can act. Um, but how can we map all of these to these? Um, how do we re really operationalize this? And so how, what do we have to do to really then get to the overall economic effect? That is something we have to think about. Also, what are the most, uh, we can never cover all of these channels. Um, so what are the most important channels we should really work hard on covering? Um, and then finally, how do we operationalize the modeling chain? So how do we get from all these biophysical impacts um, from the climate system to the economic damage? Um, and we can do process-based modeling. We can also use econometric work. Um, we can do this work in terms of putting it into a temperature-dependent damage function. It can also be time series. And what kind of approaches can we take up time series? Where does that make more sense? Uh, than doing, going through the extra work of translating it into a damage function? Um, is it sometimes, can it be even a function which is dependent on a an, on an biophysical impact? And then how do we go to the overall economic effect? So including the dynamics aside from the direct impact, all the indirect effects which happen. Um, we, this is the, the classic sort of output-centered uh, way, um, but we can also go through the different channels applying the um, so really resolving the dynamics, as I already mentioned. Um, we can also do this, uh, do the dynamics, then translate that into an aggregate output effect and then put it in. Um, so there's many different ways we can follow. Um, and then we, of course, want to close the loop and look at to, um, the full integrated assessment. Um, there is something to be asked about, um, do we really want to do all of this endogenously, um, where all of these different components are very complex, or do we really want to follow a soft coupled approach um, to be allowed to, to have more complexity in the different systems? So it would be great if we could really think about all of these questions together as a community. Um, in the following, I'd like to give three examples um, of the work we do at PIC on some of these aspects here. 
The first example is on operationalizing the modeling chain. So I will very briefly describe how we um, in the ESAP group go from climate um, to biophysical impacts to flood-related asset losses. Um, we do this first in the historic period to understand if our way of um, monitorizing the damage really is, is appropriate. And then we apply that to future projections. So we have um, hydrological models which are driven by historical climate observation data, um, which provides river discharge. Then we have an approach of inundation modeling, in, um, which is complex and um, I'm really not the expert in this, so I'm not going to go into details on this. In the end of this inundation modeling, um, we arrive at um, a time series of flood depth for on the grid cell level. Um, now we want to know um, what kind of assets are exposed to the flood. Um, and there we take a very simplified approach to take GDP and a constant um, GDP to asset ratio, which is uh, based on, um, on, on, on data, um, which gives us the exposed asset to the flood in a given grid cell. Um, and then we combine that with flood depth damage functions, which um, have been calculated by the JRC for the whole globe, um, which tells you if you have a certain flood depth, how much damage in terms of lost assets does that give you? And then we arrive at damages. Um, so we can see this here. The blue line are observations. So we look here at the period from 1980 to 2010. The blue line is observations from the NATCAD services database from Munich Re. Um, the orange line is um, what we get with this um, sim process based simulation. Um, you see that we can get the variability fairly well. Um, but there is a, an offset in the trend. Um, and we believe that this is due to the fact that we don't appropriately capture the changing vulnerability. So people will, of course, enhance their, um, their flood protection, their flood defenses over time. And that is, there is some flood protection in there, in this inundation modeling, but it's constant. And um, so what we do is uh, very simplified again. We assume that um, flood protection is related um, to GDP per capita. Um, and then we do a regression on a, on a regional, uh, regional resolution of this vulnerability ratio, which is really simply the, the difference between the observed damages and the model damages. And so we quantify, um, uh, we, can, we can find use GDP per capita as a driver to sort of model the, um, this change in vulnerability. And if we do that, um, then we get this red line here and we get a much better um, uh, much better, we, we capture the effects much better. Now, um, we are relatively satisfied that this, that this approach um, works well to model the damages. Um, we, can, we can see that they are driven um, to some degree by, by changes in the hazards, to a large degree by exposure, and then, and then of course the decreasing vulnerability plays a role, and that is very region dependent. Um, now we can take this and actually apply it to the future by taking the future flood projections, um, again, based on easy map, um, future climate data and apply it to hydrological modeling um, for two different RCPs, because that's what we have in easy map right now. Combine that with SSP-based GDP projections, and then we get uh, these time series of future global asset losses. Um, The, the scenarios we can get for this is um, limited by the easy map coverage um, from RCP scenarios, but it allows us to track uncertainty both from GCMs and from impact models. So this is not in this figure right now because all of this is very much work in progress, um, but in principle we could show here the uncertainty bars. Um, we can do this for different SSPs. Um, however, we have this problem of translating GDP, which we have for the SSPs, into assets. Um, if we keep that ratio constant, that this would be a, a strong assumption. And also, maybe in the SSP framework, we, we would have to think about different scenarios for flood protection. Um, we, we apply this, um, this approach currently um, for tropical cyclones and also floods. Um, having this time series is one thing, and there are modeling approaches where this makes a lot of sense, especially if you think about extreme events, thinking about um, the work um, uh, Massimo Tavoni presented, maybe there it would really make sense to have this time series of extreme event damage and apply in the, in the macroeconomic modeling framework. Thinking about um, the type of integrated assessment model we are doing, we really would like to have a temperature dependent damage function. Um, and we can derive this from this by combining our RCP scenarios um, with the temperature pathways we have for the different RCPs and for the different GCMs we include here. Um, so we have this 
ensemble of, um, of data points for different RCPs, different GCMs, and also impact models, and so we can create there a link to global mean temperature. Um, we haven't done that yet, but that's uh, on, on the list to do. So these are type, uh, a type of damage we would, which we would then apply to capital directly. So we apply it um, to capital in the production function, and the economic model will take care of the persistent effects which will arise there from savings rate dynamics. Um, but we also think about the, this general question of growth and persistence on the output level. And the next example is an econometric approach um, to looking at that. So we would like to understand the persistence of um, tropical cyclones and floods in terms of economic growth. We follow the literature approach by Xiang and also Burleman and Wenzel um, to have a regression um, where, the, uh, where we have economic growth here, we have country fixed effects um, sort of capturing the, the unperturbed growth path, let's say, and then we have the climate effect um, where we take into account a certain number of lags. Um, in the literature, when people look at one sector, um, they have here a sector-specific uh, predictor. So, for example, tri uh, tropical cyclone exposure or also uh, a severity index for droughts. Now, in EasyMIP, um, we would like to link multiple sectors, multiple types of extreme events together. And so it would be helpful if we had a joint predictor there. And what we uh, are trying to use here is to unify the different types of extreme, extreme events through um, the indicator of exposed population. So this is a publication by Lange et al., um, which is under review right now. We take EasyMIP data and we have projections for six types of extreme events, river floods, cyclones, droughts, fa crop failure, wildfire, and heat waves. And we look at all of those in the framework of changing fraction of exposed people uh, in terms of change of glo in global mean temperature. And so you can take all of this together and get the, the total um, fraction of uh, exposed people to all of these extreme events together. So that's kind of the, the basis um, for using uh, people affected also as a predictor in our econometric analysis here. Um, we use the period uh, data for the period from 1970 to 2012. These predict, uh, affected people here come from the EasyMIP simulations for this historical period. And then um, we run um, the regression. Um, what we're showing here are cumulative growth effects um, for a number of years um, after, after the exposure for tropical cyclones here and for fluvial floods here. And what is shown on the y-axis is the cumulative GDP growth effect uh, per percent change in normalized affected population. Um, so you, if you have in this time period an additional percent of affected population, um, then you get this additional effect here. For cyclones, <coughs> um, we really get, uh, we, we sort of find a similar result um, to the work by Xiang, um, a very robust, uh, persistent effect over, over an, a number of years after the event. For floods, um, to our knowledge, we are the first people who are trying that, and we are still a little bit struggling with the results. Um, so we, we get some persistence. Currently, we get this upturn here again, um, which may be driven by some sort of trade effects. Um, but we are still working on that. So this is just to illustrate we are working on this. This is not um, the, final, the final word on this figure. We are doing this um, not only on a global view, but also for different um, groups of countries, uh, grouped by income. And we also try to look at the drivers. So really look at, um, at the effects of consumption and, um, and other things. But uh, for thinking about integrated assessment modeling, um, the, the output effects are probably mo the most important. And then again, um, we would like to come to a temperature dependent damage. And the way we hope to do this is to combine again the fact that um, once we have this, this result, um, we have the predictor, the, the affected people already in, change of, uh, in terms of change of global mean temperature. And so we hope to be able um, to link that together and, and in the end have um, a temperature dependent damage function here. Uh, and that has the persistence in it already. Um, and so that would be applied as a growth effect on output um, in the economic modeling. Um, finally, um, we think about already not having these effects um, from EasyMIP yet. We already think about how to include persistent damages in our integrated assessment model. Um, and there we go to the literature and we have uh, 
So we have applied um, the, Burke, uh, the Burke results, um, but um, we have modified a bit. And um, why have we done that? So uh, what Burke has is uh, what he finds is a, a one-year growth effect. So you have um, the growth returns, um, but you have then um, a permanent reduction in GDP per capita, um, so, which is shown here. If you have, so that's for one shock, if you have a, a, um, a permanent temperature increase, then these effects cum accumulate. And every, time, and every um, time step, you have the same effect, and so the effects accumulate. And this is a very strong assumption. Uh, you would think um, that eventually there would be some adaptation to this. Um, the results Burke finds of this are also very large and have been debated, as, as all of you know. Um, so we try to take into account this, this strong uncertainty there uh, of this not being quite understood yet, um, and try to make this, this uncertainty transparent um, by including a finite persistence um, for the damage. So we apply the same framework of modeling the damage, the work-based damage function here, um, uh, which is applied as a, as a growth rate effect. So we have this, uh, the, the damages from the previous time steps are all taken into account, but um, they decline with a certain decline rate. And this is driven by this half-life time here, and that is a parameter we vary um, between basically the, the dice type, um, where there is no persistence, and the Burke type, where this is infinity, infinity essentially. Um, and then if we apply that in a, in a cost-benefit analysis to relate to the literature which is out there, uh, we apply that in a cost-benefit analysis with Remind. Um, so we apply these different degrees of persistence here and in the different color lines here. Yeah, on the left side, you have the 2030 carbon price. On the right side, you have uh, the emission trajectories. Um, you can see that persistence, uh, the, the degree of persistence plays a big role. It really strongly affects the results. We differentiate here between Burke long run and Burke short run. Um, the, the long run is the results um, of the analysis, which takes into account lags, but that's also not statistically significant. Um, we include it here, but the, the central case is the short case. But the message is we really need to think about the persistence because the degree of persistence has a strong effect on our results. And we need a better understanding of this. Um, finally, um, we have not um, run this analysis in a, in a completely endogenous way, um, but we believe that it makes a lot of sense to set up a system where you have the chance to have a much higher complexity on the climate and damage side. Um, right now, this is output damage, so it's not so complex. Um, but we want to think about capital damages, we want to think about inequality, we want to have, have more complexity on the side, and putting all of that on top of the already complex Remind model uh, might be really challenging. So we have developed um, in work by Schulte et al. Um, a, a soft coupled approach where we have uh, the economic uh, energy system of Remind, which produces emissions, that then goes into magic um, to, have a to get the temperature and then we have a damage module where damages are calculated um, based on, in, in this case, the Burke um, result. We translate that into a social cost of carbon, and then that is fed in um, to the optimization as a tax. Um, you can combine this um, also with a guardrail tax, so you can not only capture the damages, um, which are more the, the short-term damages, especially also if, they, if you would include channel damages there, then you, I mean, you only have one channel. Um, and you can combine it with a guardrail tax to capture um, more the long-run effects, the risk of tipping points and these kind of things, which we are unlikely to ever capture in these damage functions, to have at least total cost approach um, in the end. In the current approach, we use an analytic expression to calculate the social cost of carbon. It's possible to derive that um, for this output damage. Um, in the future, when we want to extend that to capital damages, we are working on that right now, may not be possible to do this analytically anymore. We are trying, we are working hard on it. It's challenging. Um, maybe we need to do this numerically. Um, so to conclude, connecting Remind with EasyWeb Impacts, we do this either as an output growth effect or directly in the channel. Um, and on all of these things, we are, we are still working on how to really make this happen. Um, we are working on deriving temperature-dependent damage functions based on the EasyMIP results and on this analytical expression for the social cost of carbon. Currently, we are working on capital damages um, from the floods and cyclones. In the future, we also would like to look at labor productivity, and uh, we are doing work with Shoro Dasgupta, who is somewhere in the room, who provides actually a new econometric 
a more solid base um, to look at labor productivity effects uh, and then potentially also on droughts. Um, the research questions we are mostly um, aiming to answer is what are um, what do the different channels contribute to the social cost of carbon? Um, so really, we would this channel view is very important to us aside from the aggregate view, um, the question of persistency, um, and also what are the most um, relevant channels? And yeah, it would really, especially after being here and seeing all of the work um, which is going on, I think it really would be great to have a more community-based effort to integrating impacts based on EasyMIP. Um, but also based on the econometrics, particularly with regard to EasyMIP, you see we work on two aspects of the big universe of EasyMIP damages. At PIC, we will never be able to cover them all. So it would be great um, to come together and because it will also be less work for you in the end um, if there is um, uh, um, good damages coming from this, uh, from this, you have the input then already ready, you don't have to do it yourself anymore. And I would um, actually, uh, I like that uh, Shinichi already brought up this idea of having a model under comparison with respect to impacts. I would like to um, uh, um, support this as well. I think that would be really useful. Thank you.